Hello again, Physics 30s. In today's lesson, we are going to continue to talk about radioactive decay, although the focus of the lesson today is going to be on how long does it take atoms to undergo a specific type of radioactive decay. Our learning outcome is to perform simple, non-logarithmic half-life calculations. Okay, so in the previous lesson, we talked about three different types of radioactive decay. We had alpha decay, where a parent isotope emitted an alpha particle. We had beta decay, well, beta plus or beta minus decay, where beta negative decay, we emitted an electron. Beta positive decay, we emitted a positron. And we also talked about uh, gamma, the emission of a gamma ray photon. Uh, when you go from having an excited nucleus to one that is unexcited. Uh, what we didn't talk about, though, is how long it takes for that decay to occur. So it turns out that if you had like a sample that had like maybe like 100 atoms of uranium, uh, not all of them are going to undergo alpha decay at the same time. Some of them would go undergo alpha decay where, while other ones would just do nothing. So we're going to look at a mathematical equation that can be used to model uh, how long it takes for this to occur. We refer to this as the decay rate. So the decay rate would be the rate in which you have your parent isotope turning into a daughter isotope, and it's governed by an exponential equation that looks like this. You have n is equal to no multiplied by one half to the power of little n. And that is an equation you can find on your formula sheet. In this equation, n represents the number of radioactive nuclei that are remaining after a specific amount of time has passed. When I say the number of radioactive nuclei that remains, uh, that is making reference to how much of the parent isotope has not actually decayed. Okay, so this is, a, this is a reference to the parent isotope. Oops, let's spell that correctly. Okay, that is the amount of the parent isotope that remains. NO represents the number of parent isotopes in terms of nuclei that you started with in the first place. N represents the number of half-lives that have passed. Now, in terms of what exactly a half-life is, I think we'll get into this more in the next slide, but let's say that you had like 20 grams of like a parent isotope and it underwent radioactive decay where you only had 10 grams of the parent isotope left. The time it takes to go from to, to start with your parent isotope and only have one half of it is what we refer to as a half-life. So this here would be one half-life. We can calculate half-life using the following equation. So half-life would be the amount of time that is passed divided by t to the one-half t to the one half is the amount of time that it took to go from having, for example, 20 grams of your parent isotope to 10 grams. So this would be the exact amount of time, t to the one half. A few notes about this. We'll talk more about the half-life in a moment, by the way. One, an N and NO uh, can also be expressed in units of mass or in a unit called a Becquerel. I mean, it's, it's not very likely that you would be counting the exact number of nuclei, like in a sample of some kind of radioactive substance. It's more likely that you're measuring its mass. You can also express it in, in terms of a unit called a Becquerel, 
A becquerel is an SI unit for activity. Specifically, what one becquerel tells me is it tells me how many decays are occurring in one second. So the larger the number for the becquerel, uh, for example, eight becquerel will be eight decays in a second. So it's, it's telling me that more of those parent isotope nuclei are decaying in one second. Yeah, and I've said the number of nuclei that change in a given period of time. Okay, so let's talk about the half-life. So a half-life, t to the one-half, is the time it takes for one-half of the parent isotope to decay into the daughter isotope. Or if we want to look at this in terms of radioactivity, in terms, in terms of a becquerel, it'd also be the time it takes for your activity level to decrease by a factor of one-half. Okay, so in, in this diagram, I believe we have, uh, I, I want to say 16 nuclei. So you're starting off with uh, 16 parent nuclei, and then you have zero of the daughter isotope. Now, if you go through one half-life, so one T to the one half, then the you would then have one half of the parent isotopes. Then you'd have one half of the parent isotope, but where did the other A to the parent isotope go? Well, it decayed into the daughter one. So then you'd have A to the daughter, uh, the, the daughter isotope. If you go through a second half-life, well, that'd be the time it takes for the parent nuclei to once again get cut in half. So if it gets cut in half, you'd then be down to having four of the parent uh, nuclei or isotope. And then you'd have even more of the daughter isotopes. So now you'd be up 12. And a third half-life would be, well, take this parent isotope and again, cut it in half. So in which case you'd be down to two, and then you'd be down to uh, the daughter isotope is now up to 14. And if you kept going, then the next one would be after like four half-lives, so four T to the one half. Then you'd be down to one and 15. And then once you get to five half-lives, it gets a little bit tricky. There's no guarantee this one will actually decay in the fifth half-life. So then it's up to random probability. It'd be like the, like the odds of just like flipping a coin, like whether it lands on heads or tails. So it might decay in that half-life or it might not. Okay. Because you, you, you can't take the one and you can't split it in half because it's a discrete unit. Uh, what else do I want to point out? Yeah, I, I did say that radioactivity level de decreases by one half. So you notice here, like initially... There are a lot of the parent isotopes that are turning into a daughter one. Like there's a change in like eight. And then from here to here. So like uh, like your change from the first half-life is you have a change in eight parent nuclei. Then you have a change. This is a delta symbol of four. And then you have a change in two. So the radioactivity level itself is actually decreasing too as time does pass. There's less of the parent isotope that's getting converted into a daughter one. Oftentimes we like to represent radioactive decay with a decay curve. And we can use a decay curve to determine the half-life of an element. So this is an example of a radioactive decay curve. Typically what you have is on a radioactive decay curve, you'd have time on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, you'd have the number of your parent nuclei that are still remaining. So again, you can kind of see like how, how it works here. So uh, NO would be like at a time of zero, you have all of your parent isotopes. Then after one half-life, you're down to only having one half of the original amount. Then after two half-lives, you're down to having a quarter. After three half-lives, you're down to having an eighth of the actual parent nuclei. So one way, you, one thing you can do is you, if you constructed a radioactive decay curve and you want to figure out what the half-life is. So for example, let's say that this was, well, this is state, this is 16. Okay, so this is 16. So then you'd identify, okay, so the half-life would be determined like when uh, you only have one half of the original parent isotopes, that would be eight. And then you could just simply use the graph to figure out what one half-life is. So you could go across to here from one half of the parent isotope, and you could just go straight down and then measure the time. 
there's going to be an activity at the end of this uh, at the end of this lesson where you're going to have to do this construct a radioactive decay curve. Uh, one other thing, just note the slope. So this the slope kind of shows you the activity. It's showing you like how many decays are occurring in one second. So you can see here that initially the slope is very steep, which means there's lots of decays in a second. And as time passes, the slope gets progressively flatter and flatter and flatter, which means that less decays are occurring. All right, let's do a couple of examples. So I have uh, a two kilogram radioactive isotope undergoes radioactive decay. So let's identify the variables. So uh, 2.0 grams, that is the amount you're starting with. So we'd say NO for like an original. So that is 2.0 grams. Okay, it tells me the half-life of the isotope is 45 minutes. So that's T to the one half, 45 minutes. And I want to know how much of this isotope remains after five minutes or after five hours. This is a really simple calculation. The only reason I included it as an example is just to warn you about the units for time. Make sure that they are the same units. So we can either go minutes to hours or hours to minutes. I've got more space to go to minutes here. So let's multiply by 60 minutes in one hour. So that would be 300 minutes. And what we're trying to figure out is trying to figure out what N is. We want to know how much remains after five hours. Okay, so my equation, now the way it's presented on the formula sheet is N is equal to NO multiplied by one half to the power of little n. Little n is the number of half lives, but again, you can expand it. So typically, I just like to jump right to this step where n would be equal to NO, and you have 1 over 2. And then we're just going to go T over T to the 1 half. That's how you calculate the number of half lives. Take the time and divide by the half life. All right, let's plug the numbers in. So NO is 2.0 grams. Multiply by one half times t. So t is the amount of time that's passed, so 300 minutes. And we're going to divide this by the half life, which is 45 minutes. And then we're going to get an n value. So this is n as a function of time. So that would be 0. 0.5 to the 300 over 45. Multiply by two, and then let's put this in a scientific notation. We would get a value that is, I believe, we're doing how many two significant digits? We'd have 2.0 times 10 to the negative two grams. If you wanted to, you could calculate the number of half-lives, which is n, just to see how many half-lives have passed in this situation. So the way to do that would just go 300 divided by 45. So 300 divided by 45 would tell you that there are 6.67 half-lives that have passed. Uh, and then, yeah, just a, just a way of just checking the number of half-lives that have passed. But usually we're given the half-life and the amount of time uh, that, that has elapsed. Okay, second one, uh, we're gonna deal with activity now instead of mass. So it says that the activity of a sample of whatever element Q is 28 becquerel uh, and eight hours later, its activity is seven becquerel, calculate the half-life of Q. All right, so in this one, N would represent the original activity. So the original activity is 28 becquerels. And then it tells me sometime later, uh, oh, that's NO. Yeah, NO is the original amount. Sometime later, after a time N, the activity is decreased to seven becquerels. And the time that's passed is 8.0 hours. And then we want to calculate T to the one half. Okay, I'm just going to jump straight into this equation where the little n has been expanded. So what we have is n be equal to n 
one half t over t to the one half. Okay, we need to solve for t to the one half. Now, this is a little bit tricky because mathematically, if I did want to isolate for this exponent, the only way I could do it would be to deal with logarithms. And as you just saw in the, the learning outcome, it said perform non-logarithmic calculations. So even though you could use logs, there is a way where we have a bit of a workaround here. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to isolate the exponent and its base. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by NO. So I'd have N over NO is equal to 1 half T over T to the 1 half. I'm going to plug some numbers in here. So again, we, again, we're, we had need to do this because like, again, we can't isolate unless we apply logs. And, and again, I'm going to avoid it. Uh, all right, so n is 7bq. Uh, n o is 28bq. And now it'd be equal to 1 half to the power of, okay, 8 hours has passed. We have 8.0 hours divided by t to the 1 half. Okay, so the question is, how can we get around using logs here? Not that the logs are difficult to use, but we just don't need to do it. Okay, what you're going to look for is when you get this fraction n over n o, uh, I want to turn it into a, a reduced fraction. Okay, so a reduced fraction for 7 over 28 would be, what's the largest number that the 7 and 28 is divisible by? Well, it's 7. So if I divided both the top and the bottom by 7, this would then turn into a fraction that would be 1 over 4. Okay, that'd be 1 over 4 is equal to 1 half, and then t, which is 8.0 hours. Let's just write down the 8.0 hours divided by t to the 1 half. What you want to do is you want to rewrite this fraction of n over n o as a fraction that has a base of one half because I want to compare it to the right side of the equation. So if I write that fraction as a base of one half, what would be the power attached to it? Well, one half squared would be one fourth. So you'd have one half squared would be equal to one half and then 8.0 hours divided by t to the one half. If the bases on each side of the equation are the same, then I can solve the equation just by equating the exponents. So if I equate the exponents, I would then have 2 is equal to 8.0 hours divided by t to the 1 half. And then just manipulate these guys by flipping the 2 and the t to the 1 half around. And the t to the 1 half would then be equal to 8.0 hours divided by 2. So your t to the one half would be 4.0 hours, which tells you that, well, if the half life is 4.0 hours, we've gone through two half lives, and that makes sense. You'd have a quarter of the original uh, parent isotope left afterwards. So just uh, again, when you're solving problems like this, and again, you don't need to use logs. Uh, because we don't have to use logs, every problem when you find this like fraction n over n naught, it needs to be a fraction that can be written with a base of one half. So that's going to be fractions that are either one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, one over sixty four, one over one twenty eight, and probably not going to go much beyond that because usually after five half lives, the the sample has decayed. All right, so what you need to do is you're going to complete a, a lab. Now, uh, I'm going to provide sample data. The, the lab essentially involves using Skittles candies to, to model radioactive decay in terms of like whether uh, an, an, a nuclei undergoes decay or not. If you want, like, so uh, on the assignment, I'll provide the sample data I've collected from a previous year. So the first part of the assignment is like you get the sample data and you got to construct a decay curve. And from the decay curve, you need to determine what the half-life is. 
Uh, and then the second part are just some additional problems. The additional problems have nothing to do with the lab. They're all just half-life calculations. So bare minimum, at least be doing the half-life calculations. Now, if you want, you can go ahead and use my sample data, or if you want, you could go to the store. Well, not, not that I'm encouraging you to do this right now. In fact, that's probably not a good idea. But if you had a bunch of Skittles candies on hand, then you could actually do the lab yourself by flipping the Skittles candies around. Although whenever I do it, I do it with, uh, uh, I get like multiple groups to do it and I take their combined total because the, the more trials you do in terms of random probability, the more the probability kind of evens out. If you just have like one group do it, like they can get like some data that's not totally what it's supposed to look like because things haven't averaged out at that point. But anyways, uh, it's it, it's uh, it's up to you. Uh, I would probably just use, uh, in, in terms of safety, I would probably just use the uh, the sample data I provide to do it. But if you do have some Skittles candies around, then like by all means, you can go ahead and do it to, to get like maybe a better hands-on understanding of the lab. Okay, so that's it for this lesson. And then in the next one, we're going to shift gears and start to discuss uh, a branch of physics known as particle physics. And I'll talk to you then.